So the one thing that I really want every project manager and every project leader and indeed any leader who's related to projects, and that means any leader because no leaders today don't deal with projects, is your biggest risk is you. You are your own biggest risk. The problem with project management is that risk is misperceived, that people don't understand what the risks are and therefore they go wrong. So it's not that all these objective risks are not out there and people like to think about risk as something that's coming from the outside and hitting you, like the bad weather in construction or the archaeology that we talked about earlier or the world prices of steel or concrete, you know, or the materials that you need or the price of labor. These are all things coming from the outside and we like to think about risk like that. I'm saying that's wrong. Hello and welcome to the Capital Projects Podcast. My name is Andreas Schoma and I'm your host here to discuss the main challenges of capital projects and project management. We already know that delivering a project on time and on budget is a huge challenge for all of us in all industries and we need to learn from past mistakes in order to deliver better value in the future. So today I'm really happy to host this episode here with Professor Bent Fluvia one of the most respected researchers on capital projects and author of the book, How Big Things Get Done. Professor Fluvier was the first BT professor of major program management at Said Business School at Oxford University, position that he held until September 2021. He works for better management of mega projects and cities. He's the most cited scholar in the world of mega projects and the author of 10 books and more than 250 different papers publish it in 20 languages. He has pioneered research on behavioral science, including the influence of power of decision-making for mega projects. His new book, written with Dan Gardner, received great reviews from The Economist and The Financial Times, and is also listed as one of the top 15 books by The Financial Times for the year 2023. So let's see what Professor Ben Flubier has to teach us about mega project management. Professor Fluvier, welcome to the Capital Projects podcast. It's an honor to have you here talking to our community in Brazil. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. First of all, how did you get involved in the world of mega projects in your career? Just by watching what's going on around me in society. So I'm Danish and uh, several decades ago, back in Denmark, when I was a pre professor at Aalborg University there, the Danish government decided to do a giant project, 17 times, so one seven times more expensive than the biggest project that, that they had ever done. Wow. This was in, would include the world's longest suspension bridge when it was completed and the second longest underwater uh, rail tunnel in Europe. So a giant project and everything went wrong with this project. So I got curious as a, as a scholar, uh, as a university professor, I was wondering, is this normal? I mean, or is Denmark just very incompetent in doing this or very unlucky? And what is the typical situation when other people try to do build projects, uh, to build big projects like this? And I started to look around the world for data and I found there were none. There were no data, even though uh, the world was already at that time building for trillions of dollars globally mm -hmm. of this kind of project. Nobody would, was able to answer the question of, is, is cost overrun normal? If it's normal, how big is it normally? What's the average cost overrun? How often does it happen? And the same with demand, you know, and, and time schedules. So this is the kind of thing a university professor likes. There's a wide area on the map. Nobody has studied it. So I just started to study it on the basis of my observations of this one project, uh, back in Denmark, which is really the project that started it all for me. Oh, that's interesting. Interesting story. As you said, starting a project 17 times more expensive than the largest one is such an audacious move. So in the latest book, your latest book that we're here to talk about, How Big Things Get Done, that you wrote with Dan Gardner, it's a worldwide success with great reviews from Financial Times, The Economist, and also from personalities such as the architect Frank Gehry that you mentioned in the book and the Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman. Please tell us a bit more about the scope of the research you conducted and the objectives of this new book. So first of all, I'm deeply honored that people like Daniel Kahneman and Frank Gehry, Nassim Nicholas Taleb and others have uh, 
recommended the book because they are actually very big intellectual influences on my work and including uh, on the work on the book, as we mentioned in the book. So, so it's a special honor. The reason that we decided to, to do this book was uh, that we feel that there's a real need to understand uh, what's going on with projects around the world. So more and more projects are being built and they're getting bigger and bigger really quickly. And uh, people are talking about the world becoming projectified, meaning that more mm -hmm. and more things are done as projects, as, as anybody who uh, is in the work uh, place knows more and more things are done as projects. And in my area, it's gigantic projects, like multi-billion uh, dollar projects. Uh, and um, we know from our data that the majority of projects actually don't go very well. Mm -hmm. So now we have data to document this. We didn't used to have that, but this, because of our research, we have generated a huge amount of data and we now know exactly what the issues are with projects. And we know that the issues are serious. They are very widespread. And then we wanted to ask the question, given the fact that there are so many failures, how can we make more successes? Mm -hmm. How can we make more successes? That's what we focus on in the book. So we didn't want to just keep, uh, you know, pounding <laughs> the on the news. projects for being bad, you know, on not on budget, not on time and so on. Uh, we wanted to get to the stage where we could say, okay, if that's the situation, what do we do to change things? And where are the people who actually already know to, how to do this? Where are the organizations who already know how to deliver projects successfully? So that's what we set out to explore. And that's what we explain in the book, you know, what is it that these people and these organizations do that make their projects succeed and that we can learn from when we do our own projects? And that's whether it's a big project like uh, putting up a skyscraper or whether it's a small thing like a kitchen renovation. We have a whole mm -hmm. chapter about a kitchen renovation in the book yeah. or putting on a festival or a party or you name it. So it's from the very small uh, projects, but that are still important in our personal lives to these very gigantic infrastructure projects or IT projects or transformation projects of whole uh, big organizations, big companies and so on, governments. Yeah, I remember the chapter about the kitchen renovation and it reminds me of a renovation I did here in my home. I, I thought that was bad. No, I did a bad job, but the, <laughs> the chapter is even worse. Um, and as you said, the, the commas will we, we'll get there. Sometimes the, the, the reasons for failure are, are common. And right at the beginning of the book, you mentioned that average practice is a disaster, best practice an outlier. I think that this scares most of the project managers involved in the construction industry. How bad are the outcomes of this mega project you had the chance to research? So um, they're so bad that we actually formulated a law that we call the iron law of mega projects. And it says, over budget, over time, under benefits, over and over again. So that's the pattern. And uh, it's a very clear statistical pattern. So we've started this across more than 16,000 projects. And the specific numbers are that only 8.5% of projects are on budget and on time, you know, 8.5%. 8.5%. Yeah. Wow. Which means that, that, uh, that 92.91.5% uh, of projects uh, are actually not on on budget or not on on schedule or not on both you know so that's uh, that's the situation if you include um, the desired outcome so what's called the benefits normally and which which are the real reason that you're doing projects we we are doing projects we are incurring all these costs and all this time that it takes to do a project in order to deliver certain benefits these mm -hmm. are the promises of the projects and if we include those only half a percent live up to their promises and are on budget and are on time so half a percent, half percent. It, it's almost zero, you know, and, and that, that's, uh, that's the situation. That's the, the real situation of projects. So there, there's a lot of work to do, uh, to improve the situation. And, and the good news is that mm. more and more organizations, more and more businesses, more and more governments are beginning to realize this, that we need to do something about this. So there's a lot of work going on in the world right now on trying to improve this situation which is necessary because we have, you know, tens of thousands of very big projects coming up and being done right now to deal with the energy transition. So just, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if we're going to solve the problem of the climate crisis, this is going to be done by 
thousands and thousands of mega projects and we need to ensure that they actually succeed, that they don't become the failures. But if because if they become the failures, we're toast, you know, we're not going to have a chance with the climate uh, crisis. But luckily, the good news is that uh, that actually certain types of energy projects perform very well. And, and we have found, we have found, you know, the explanations of why do some products go very bad and why do other products go very well. There's one, one important thing you mentioned about the benefits that we see. And in some sectors, in the private sector, sometimes you have a good margin in your operations, like you get oil and gas and mining. And OK, our project was not delivered on budget. It was delayed like for a year or two, but at least it is producing and once it is producing i have cash flowing into the company and that's fine we are making money but as you said if we go out and research the actual production of that project we see that they are not they are really far from delivering what they promised in the first place so your whole business case is not working because you spend a lot of money more than expected took it a lot more time and are sometimes delivering 60 70 percent of the um, the planet production so why do you think it's so hard for companies and even governments to check on the benefits that were actually delivered by by the projects the first thing is that there's not enough focus on benefits benefits are typically the things that is the furthest out in the future mm -hmm. and we human beings uh, we don't like to think far into the future our brains just don't want to do it we like to we are nearsighted we have myopia you know time wise mm -hmm. we just want to see what's right in front of us and in a way you know that's understandable that's useful for survival that you focus on what's happening right around you because in order to survive you need to uh, be present and uh, and know these things however when you are planning multi-billion dollar projects you actually also need to look far into the future uh, so we need to overcome this myopia that we are seemingly hardwired with this is part of our mental makeup yet that we think like that so when you ask why is it that uh, that people are so bad at benefits this is one of the reasons that there's not enough focus also i mean per definition it's more difficult to predict something that is further out in the future than something mm -hmm. that is closer but it's not even the main concern in the beginning all of a sudden people just focus on how do we deliver this project? How do we actually get it built or whatever it is designed and, and delivered? And uh, how do we do it on budget? How, first, how do we get enough money to do it? And then how do we stay on the budget? Uh, and, uh, and also how do we stay on the schedule? So the thing about benefits is like, people just forget about it. That's my experience. And that's, a, that's actually a big difference between the people who are successful and the people who are unsuccessful. The people who are successful never forget about the benefits. So that's one of the secrets that we have found secret to success is that if you want to be successful, focus on the benefits. Right. And considering the extent of your research, you're author of 10 books and more than 250 papers translated in different languages, more than 20 different languages. In your view, what are the most common causes of disasters in mega project management? So we have a thing we say in the book that I really like, and that is that uh, projects don't go wrong, they start wrong. Just to yeah. make people think, you know, like you, th this sounds like a contradiction in term, they don't go wrong. Hey, that's what we talk about all the, the time. Why did this project go wrong? And that's our language. So I'm, what we're saying is the language is wrong. When you look at the numbers and when you look what actually happens, the projects actually don't go wrong, they start wrong. And because they start wrong, there's not there's not a chance you know to deliver them successfully and that's why they go wrong so to illustrate if you have a completely unrealistic business case no matter how good a team you get they can't deliver it and that's actually the situation uh, for a majority of projects so why do people make all these unrealistic business cases that's the next question right and we also have very clear explanations of this we've started that in detail and we find actually it's two main things so there are two causes. First, psychology. Second, power. So these are the two main causes. The psychology are cognitive biases that we have. Optimism is the most famous cognitive bias. And as you can see, if you're optimistic about a business case, your product is going to look cheaper than it's actually going to be. It's going to look as if you can do it faster than you actually can. And it's going to look as if it will deliver more benefits than it actually will. That's optimism played out. 
on the variables that we measure for projects. The second thing is power, I said. So power is when people deliberately do these things. So optimism is innocent. People don't do it deliberately. If you talk about deliberate optimism, it's not optimism anymore. Then it's manipulation, right? So optimism is something we are hardwired with, again, for nature, and again, probably for good survival reasons. We need to be optimistic to get through life, you know, and get up in the morning and do what we have to do. Uh, and therefore, from, from nature, we are hardwired to do this, and we are not even aware of our, ourselves being optimistic when we are optimistic. However, the power thing is deliberate. So this is the oldest trick in the book that you can deliberate. If you know that my project is going to compete with other projects for approval and for funding, I know exactly what to do with my project. I'm going to make it really nice. I'm going to write it up so it looks beautiful in the beauty contest that it's going into for competition. So how do I make it look beautiful? Well, easy. I make it look cheap. People like cheap, you know. Cheap is much better than expensive. I'm going to make it appear as if we can deliver it very quickly. People like to get things quickly and not have to wait 10, 15 years to get things. That's so far in the future. Who cares? No, I'm going to promise you four or five years we have this. And uh, lastly, I'm going to promise more benefits. So I write more benefits into my uh, business case. And, and again, it makes the project look good on paper. So when I've done all this and I submit my project for approval and funding, I have a higher chance of getting approved. It's called cooking the books. It's deliberate cooking of the books. And that's the second major explanation of why we have all these business cases that are unrealistic upfront and therefore go wrong. And this is what I mean when I say projects start wrong instead of they go wrong. They start wrong because of psychology and power manipulating the business cases so they become very unrealistic. And I mean very when I say very. We are talking about very high percentages that the, that the products are off, you know, in the initial business cases. When we come in later and then we compare the actual outcomes to what was promised at the outset. That's what we do systematically, you know, in, in thousands and thousands of projects. This is a big challenge for decision making, right? Because uh, I used to say that we are always approving or not always, but most of the time, maybe approving the worst projects that we have because poorly defined projects will look like they are cheaper, as you said, and faster. So the more we study these big challenges, more expensive it will be or appear during during planning. So the ones that have the best business case are the ones that have the, the, the largest or the biggest um, internal rate of return. And you can achieve that, as you said, by making the project look better than it really is. So it's a big challenge in decision making because once that some executives don't have the background to evaluate the project properly, they will be seduced by the business case and we will end up approving it. So um, I, I just think on how can we take this bias out when we are discussing mega projects, uh, especially when executives have to approve in the gates. So we have developed tools for doing this and data analytics. We have even developed artificial intelligence now. So we are doing this with the help of artificial intelligence, uh, which of course is the rage, it's the fashion. Everybody wants artificial intelligence. And we actually found it's quite easy to develop an AI unit that is able to uh, do these things if you have the right, if you have the right data. So that's really the secret is to have the right data. But no matter whether it's AI or it's manual or what it is, we call it debiasing. It's, it's about debiasing the projects at the outset. Uh, so if we are biased in our brains because of uh, psychology and power, and we know that that's built into the business cases, we actually have developed the analytics where we can run a business case through our analytics and we can measure very precisely what the bias is and then we can take the bias out on the basis of all these other projects of similar kinds where we where we have the outcomes, right? We know what the typical bias is for a project like this, and uh, and we can apply that for debiasing, and that's what we do. It's very it's very rigorous, it's very data driven and data based, and it really works, and it's done on thousands of projects around the world now. Great. I was thinking here that you talk about the fat tail and the cost distribution of projects, and maybe we can uh, talk about it now. And the way that some executive, executives present their projects is looked at, like the fat tail is on the opposite side, right? So 
the estimates are always conservative. The schedule is always also conservative and the benefits will be better than that. And what we see is the fat tail. So we have some disasters of projects costing 200, 300% or more than the, the, um, it was planned. And you mentioned the book um, that we should look for ways to cut the tail. How can we do this in, in mega projects? So the first step is to be aware that there is a tail. And I would say the vast majority of project planners and leaders, they are not aware of this. They don't even know that, that projects are fat tail. So we have now proven, and it's in the book, that about 80% of all project types are fat tails. So wow. that means that, means that uh, all your risk management tools that are assuming normal or near normal distribution, they go down the drain. They are not even, they are not just useless. They are worse than useless because they give you a false sense of security, right? You think that you have estimated the risk. You think you have done all your sophisticated Monte Carlo simulations. It looks very scientific and very quantitative, very mathematical. And uh, hey, with all these numbers and all these curves, surely this must be right. No, if you are assuming the wrong distribution for your Monte Carlo simulations, your Monte Carlo simulation is going to be bullshit. It's going to be garbage in, garbage out. And that's what happens in the majority of risk assessment, quantitative risk assessment for projects. So the first thing is to be aware that the fat tails are there. Then, then we can start talking about, okay, given that they're there, how do we cut them? How do we get rid of the tails? And we give some examples of this in the book. One example I like especially is, is from the UK, uh, where I'm speaking from right now. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking from Oxford uh, in the UK. And we worked with the, the management of High Speed 2, which is the high speed rail line being built right now between London and Birmingham and further to the north. It's the biggest construction project in all of Europe huge uh, a budget that they don't even know what it's going to cost but they they think somewhere north of 100 billion pounds so 100 north of 100 billion so it's hugely expensive and um, high speed rail has fat tails so that what we did was take all the high speed rail projects that are in our database and study them first of all plot them out and see what were what were the cost overruns on these projects uh, and then we identified the ones that were in the fat tail. So each of the projects in the fat tail was identified by name. And we went in and we studied each project and found out, okay, what, what were the specific reasons that this uh, ended up as a black swan, you know, as an outlier, as an extreme value? What were the specific reasons that the budget blew up on this project? And we we found, you know, a set of reasons. Uh, they say, around 10 different reasons and and uh, some of them uh, like 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 a top 10 you know where number one was the most important and so on amongst the the top three you know was one that appeared over and over was archaeology so obviously when you start digging uh, a project you, you you have to put a rail line across a landscape especially an old landscape like the english landscape where people have lived for for thousands of years, uh, uh, you will come across a lot of archaeological sites. And the law is that every time you hit a site like that, you have to stop construction and you have to call in archaeologists and and uh, and uh, and do an archaeological investigation. So basically, you know, uncover what's there and so on and and uh, measure it and, and map it and so on and, and bring the artifacts into the museums uh, or storage. And this turned out to be a big headache, you know, for these projects, because for many reasons, you know, that it, it takes time and there aren't that many archaeologists around. So we, we, we made a brainstorm. How do, how do we best solve this? I mean, we need to get archaeology out as a cause to, uh, to push projects out into the tail. How do we do that? So HS2 actually decided we are going to, we are going to put every archaeologist in England, hold on, every archaeologist in England on a retainer. We're going to pay every archaeologist in England to be ready to come when we have an archaeological dig that we hit so that we don't have to wait for the hiring process and finding people and so on. No, they're ready. It's like calling a taxi. You know, you call, you call, it's like calling Deliveroo. You call the Deliveroo of archaeologists and, and they will show up on the side and they'll get to work immediately. And you'll have a whole pool, you'll have a whole pool of archaeologists like this. So this, this helps solve this problem. 
And then it actually generated just just a side story, but it generated a very positive side effect because it turned out that all of a sudden HS2 became the biggest, uh, you know, uh, provider of archaeological information in the country. So they actually turned all this information into a website that people could go to and they could follow it. So they became very popular with people who were interested in archaeology as a, as a positive side effect. But the, the main thing that we were trying to achieve was just to get, just to get archaeology, uh, out of, as a driver of getting into the fat tail. And we did this, you know, item by item. And in that way, we reduced the risk of ending up in the fat tail substantially. So that's how you, how you work with cutting the tail. We can see how important it is to learn from past experience and to really apply this on, on the projects. We see some companies that are really capital intensive have sorts of different complex projects and large projects and they have, they repeat failure after failure, seems to be unable to get those lessons learned and incorporate into the project delivery system. Uh, I don't know if you uh, also, if this is also part of your research, but if so, I'd like to, to know your vision about it. How is, why is so hard for companies to learn from past experience and really apply the best practices in their projects? So first of all, we hear this over and over all the time that people don't understand. We cannot believe, you know, that we have now made the same mistake again that we did on the previous similar project that we did on the one before that and before that. We just keep making the same mistake here. And I would say that the one reason is that, that m most organizations are actually, even they, even though they have rhetoric to the opposite, they actually are not really that focused on learning. And you need to be focused on learning if you're going to make this work. Learning is the key thing. If you're going to, if you want to be good at projects, you've got to be good at learning. So the question becomes, how do you learn? Well, that's very well studied. You know, efficient learning actually requires you're doing the same thing over and over. And you're doing it over and over with a high frequency. So fairly often you don't, you don't do one and then you wait 50 years to do the other. Like when you put on the Olympics, mm -hmm. you might do it just once in the, you know, Rio is putting on the Olympics. They do it once and then it never happens again. Or it happens in 50 years. You know, if, if any city is doing it twice, it's usually with a very long intermission. You don't learn how to put on the Olympics by doing it every 50 years or just once in a lifetime, right? Same with nuclear power plants. You build a nuclear power plant and then it takes, you know, decades until you build the next nuclear power plant. There's no learning when you do it like that. So you need to have things that you do with a high frequency over and over. Otherwise, the research shows that there will be no efficient learning. Okay. So that actually, we can turn that into heuristics uh, for how to do projects successfully. It means you want to stay away from things that are only done very rarely. You want to stay from things that are not repeatable, where you don't do things the same way every time you do them. So bespoke things, like even if you did things often, if they are bespoke every time, it doesn't work. You don't learn from bespoke things, and there's nothing to use the knowledge for, even if you learn, because it's bespoke, right? So the next would be different. So lesson number one, if you see a project that is bespoke and slow and doesn't happen very often or only one off, you don't do it. You just walk away. You say, no, thank you. We're not doing this. This is not something we do because we know that it's a recipe for failure to do projects that have these structural characteristics. At the other end of the scale, you have projects that you do repeatedly, very quickly. You do another one. So think about building a wind turbine. Hey, you build a wind turbine. You can do it in a few days. Then you build another one. You can put it up in one day. That's what's happening now. They're being put up, erected at sea, even in, under the very difficult circumstances of the North Sea and the Irish Sea, which are some has some of the worst storms and worst weather in the world. They put them up one per day and they are larger than they ever were, you know, because they're doing it all the time. They get better. So we did one yesterday. Tomorrow we're going to do one where we get a little better. We're already a little better. And then the day after we're a little better than that and so on and so on and so on. Now they've been doing that for decades. So they are really good now and they know how to do it. It's a standard thing that you can do in a modular way. If you think about a wind turbine, it's not bespoke. It's, it's, it's completely standard. You have a foundation that you actually produce in a factory. You have a tower, same thing. You have the nacelle with the turbine itself, so the generator for the electricity, and then you put wings on. 
those are the four elements that go into a wind turbine. They are very standardized. They're like, in the book, we call it Legos. I'm Danish, mm-hmm. like I said, and Lego yeah. is the largest toy company in the world, and it's a Danish company. And I think we all know what Lego bricks are, right? Mm-hmm. They're the ultimate modular thing. That's how you want your project to be. You want your project to be like Lego. So when you build a wind turbine foundation, click tower, click nacelle, click wings, ready. Click, 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 and you're done. No, you need to put on the cable so you can actually send the electricity uh, ashore, right, or, or, or to the power station. So that's what you want to look for if you want learning. You, you want standardized projects, modular projects, projects that can be done quickly over and over that are repeatable so you learn. That's the secret. And here's the clinch. Very interesting. The modular projects, the Lego projects, don't have fat chains. The bespoke projects, the slow projects have very fat chains. So this is totally correlated, you know, that this is actually, this is how you produce your risk or get rid of your risk. The fat tailed risk, which is the real killer in projects, you know. So by going modular, standardized, repeatable learning, using the learning model, you're eliminating the fat tailed risk. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I was checking here the, the appendix in your book, you show a table with uh, the mean cost overrun for different industries. And we see clearly solar power and wind power are the best ones in terms of, um, that's of performance. The yeah, that one. <laughs> That's gold. We will see. We don't have large uh, overruns. And um, so many times we see projects that even that are similar to others, you know that engineers just love to customize things. So, yeah, I can make this bean a little bit uh, uh, shorter here, different from the past project. And, and sometimes the development process, the getting to the suppliers, the material, it will all compensate if you make it modular and much faster than the previous one, as you said. And I would say that engineers who think like that, they're the engineers of the past who think about customizing things and, and they want to make this special case. This is, this is the tradition from, from uh, craftsmanship, you know, and mm-hmm. it, it, I have a lot of respect for that. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, sure. There are lots of things where that is a good idea, but it's not the future in what we're talking about. We'll never be able to solve the energy crisis if it's all, you know, bespoke craftsmanship. And uh, the engineering of the future, and, and there is a new generation of engineers. And if you want to find a country where they are, China. China totally gets this. So China understands uh, modularity is the, is the key to success. That's why they have taken the lead in renewables. That's mm-hmm. why they've taken the lead in batteries. That's why they are now beginning to take the lead, lead in electric vehicles and so on. They are, and, and even construction, you know, which is the most difficult area to modularize uh, historically. They're already doing it. They're building skyscrapers in 21 days, you know, because it's all modular. They're just stacking Legos and and, and building skyscrapers like that. Uh, A lot of people get worried when you talk about that because they have this uh, historical image, you know, of really ugly, low-quality buildings that were built Mm -hmm. in this standardized way. But today we can say that it doesn't have to be that way. It can be completely high-quality, unique design made by the best architects in the world, and it can be still be completely manufactured in a modular way. Or now with the, with the digitalization of construction, it doesn't mm-hmm. even have to be modular. Anything you can design on a computer, you can manufacture. Yeah. So you don't even need to go modular. And anything you can die, design on a computer, you can get the best architect in the world to design it. It's just a matter of choosing the right architect. That's what Frank Gehry is doing. He's one mm-hmm. of our heroes. And... Uh, and we talk a lot about him in the book because he has cracked this problem of actually being able to digitize his building without compromising design or quality. Actually, the opposite. He's he's getting better design, he says, because of the digitalization. And he's getting higher quality. And he actually gets to stay on budget and to stay on schedule because he simulates his buildings on the computer before he builds them in reality. And he understands this thing that You don't want a construction site. You want an assembly site. The more you can manufacture, the better. The more you can manufacture, the less risk you have. Sure. It's very interesting also in the book that I mentioned, Frank Gehry, that you said that uh, he refused to uh, have a jumpstart in the um, the Bilbao Museum 
just getting the requirements from, from the local government and starting design, he looked and said, no, that's not the best alternative for what you want, right? And then got to a really a completely different design and construction, which is a, a huge success. That's what we see in, in general. And we use him as an example. We use Pixar as another example. So we don't stay mm -hmm. just with, with, with material product, uh, you know, material projects like construction and so on. We also look at, at making films and uh, doing IT systems, doing organizational change, anything that can be called a project we look at. And what we see with the successful project leaders, no matter what area they, they're in, whether it's construction or whether it's film, mm -hmm. that they do what Gary does. They actually start with a why. So he, he emphasized this when we, so I've known Gary for decades and I've interviewed him many times, including several times for the book. And when we interviewed him, he emphasized, when we asked him, what is the secret to this? Is, I always start with a why. I'm, I'm asking the client, why do you want to do this project? What is, what is it that you want to achieve? And then only when that is clear and when we agree on what the why is and have discussed it for ev from every angle, do we actually start designing the project? Uh, and that's what he did in Bilbao. And, and he actually suggested that the way that the local government wanted to do things was not a way that would be efficient to achieving what they wanted. So he asked them, why do you want to do this? And they said, we want to put Bilbao on the world map because this is now, uh, at that time, it was a very backward uh, re region that was in recession. So it was based on shipping and steel and shipping and steel as industries were tanking. And it was very clear that the future was not in, in, in shipping and steel for a country like Spain. So Bilbao, uh, the region was based on shipping and steel. And now they wanted to, they actually told Gary, we want you to build a Sydney Opera House for <laughs> for Bilbao. So a lot of people talk about the Bilbao effect, but it's really mm -hmm. a Sydney effect because they asked for a Sydney effect in Bilbao. And then they suggested they had this beautiful old, old winery uh, that they suggested to use for a Guggenheim Museum, a Guggenheim Art Museum in Bilbao. And they were hoping that this would attract uh, enough visitors. And Gary said, okay, now I understand why you want to do it. And, and thank you. It's a very clear remit. You know, it's very easy for me to understand what you want to do, very specific. And I know the Sydney Opera House very well. I know the design, you know, how important that has been to attract people to Australia. Uh, I understand uh, how it was built and what it's done for Sydney and for actually indeed for all of Australia. But I don't know one example of anybody who has taken an old building and then been able to do what you want to do by renovating an old building. So I can't think of one example. So I think if this is what you want to do, that's the wrong solution. Now let's think of something else. And they just, they basically, they went for a lunch, you know, on, I don't know if you've been to Bilbao, but it's like in a river valley and they went on top of one of the river uh, sides and where on a, on a big hill where they looked down on the city center and, and, uh, and Frank Gary said, Hey, what about that? Uh, what about that? That there's an old derelict factory right down there uh, by a bridge across the river. And you know, in Sydney, there's a bridge, there's the harbor bridge mm -hmm, in yeah. Sydney. How here you have a bridge, you know, and here you have an old, like the old bus depot in Sydney uh, or, or a tram depot in Sydney that was at Benelong Point before they built the opera house. There's an old factory here. Can we get that plot? You know, I think that's the location. And there are great sidelines to different parts of the city center. Uh, so I think that's actually a great location. Can we get it? And, and they investigated quickly and they, they found out that they could actually buy that lot. And they did. And Gary designed the building for that lot, taking the bridge into account in a very, you know, convincing and attractive manner. And the rest is history. Yeah. Huge success built on budget, actually $4 million below budgets. At a, and on a pretty small budget, that was only a hundred million dollars, which is not a lot, you know, for the square meters they got. Mm -hmm. And built on time and delivering about three or four times more benefits than they ever hoped for in their wildest dreams. So many more people are coming to visit. Many more people stay in hotels, buy food, uh, stick around, you know, uh, buy things in the shops and enjoy the Basque region and, and northern Spain. So uh, a huge success in every way, even the people who are most skeptical at the outset, and there were skeptics, serious skeptics, uh, uh, for instance, from the local art community, 
that they thought mm. that now if you get a Guggenheim, this is so high profile that the local art is going to suffer. They say exactly the opposite has happened. It actually turns out that having this many people come into Bilbao who are seriously interested in art has lifted every uh, gallery in town, you know, that more people are now buying local art from the local galleries than they were before. So just an example, you know, of, of one of the, the benefits that uh, people thought were going to be a problem, but turned out to be, uh, you know, an asset instead. And a fantastic example of starting with why, as you yeah. said, the first thing that Frank did was understanding why they wanted to do it and then conducted the project to the opposite way. We call it thinking from right to left. So the why you put on the right in the box on the right in your flow chart for how you're going to do the project. Then you start thinking backwards from mm -hmm. that, but you know what the outcome is going to be. So in, in Bilbao, it was, we are going to have a Sydney Opera House in Bilbao with the same effects, you know. Now, how do we do that? And then you work backwards and, and you, you figure out every step of the way you, with the design and everything and, and everything that else that goes into it. And then you start on the left and you move towards the right without ever forgetting what's on the right. You always keep in mind in the back of your mind what's on the right. And that helps you no matter where you are in the process. If you just ask yourself what's out there on the right, you can measure yourself against whether am I contributing to the thing on the right now or not. If you're not, stop doing what you're doing and start doing something that is actually contributing to, to what is on the right. So that's we call that thinking from right to left. Interesting. And uh, you mentioned Pixar uh, here and also in the book, I found this really interesting to understand how you can learn from animated movies in order to bring those lessons learned to, to mega projects. What, what you found was most the most interesting thing to see how Pixar developed its movies and how can we learn from it in applying in engineering and construction? So it's the same as, as what Gary did. That's what Pixar is doing. They simulate their films just like Gary simulates his buildings on computers before they do them. So uh, that's the secret. And it's about learning. So we talked about learning earlier. This is also about learning. When you simulate something, you learn. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a common thing in architecture and engineering to do mock-ups, right? So you, do, you build yeah. mock-ups in order to learn, you know, like how does this thing look in reality and, and what are the issues involved in actually getting it to work and so on. And you do a mock-up. But you can do that. I mean, people are still doing mock-ups, and that's a great thing. I mean, people should keep doing mock-ups, but now on computers, you can go into much more detail than you can with a mock-up, and you can actually simulate your project uh, on a computer before you do them. And that's what Pixar does. Uh, and um, this is, again, this thinking slow uh, in order to act fast. This is a slogan we have in the book, think slow, act fast. Uh, And if you don't think slow up front, you won't be able to act fast because there are going to be so many problems that are slowing you down because you didn't think about them before you started. That's what Pixar does. And they do it very specifically by starting. They, they start out with an idea. So let's say an, a director get an idea. We interviewed both the CEO of Pixar and the creative director of P Pixar. Mm -hmm. And the creative director explained that he often gets his ideas in the shower, maybe after yeah. a run or something. <laughs> and, and, and he just gets out and writes it down. It might just be like two lines or a paragraph. That's the start of a movie. So he gave an example, uh, you know, like uh, a girl who's all in her head <laughs> or a rat that likes to cook, you know, a rat mm -hmm. that likes to cook. Those are ideas, you know, that just, they're just like that, uh, an idea, a few words, a few lines at the outset. Then you take the idea and you try to develop, maybe write a couple of pages, two, three pages, maybe five, but not more. And then you circulate it to your other directors as Pixar and, and other colleagues who are doing films and you get feedback. Like, what do you think about this? Is this something that would work? What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? You are, you are used to doing films. What would really work with the audience? What wouldn't work with the audience? And the director get this feedback. They don't have to use it. It's, uh, it's optional whether you want to use it or not. So the director accumulates all this feedback and then writes a longer version of the of the script for the film, which in the next version might be 10, 15 pages, etc. And it goes around around like this. Uh, and this is an iterative process where there's a lot of learning in each step. And this is what it's about learning again. And uh, at one stage, they will then start using storyboards. Now, now they don't do it on uh, just a script anymore. They actually take the script and they put it on storyboards. And it might just be 
uh, you know, a, f- a dozen or a few dozen storyboards at first. So they get, you know, like different scenes and they get, you can put the storyboards up in a, a, a time sequence. So you can see like, how is this film going to unfold? And again, they get feedback on this and then they do some more storyboards, maybe a hundred or 200 and they get more feedback. They start thinking about what kind of music should be behind these scenes. What kind of voiceover should be behind these scenes? Who should do, who should be doing the voices? What should be set and so on. And then they end up with uh, several thousand storyboards, you know, and then they start using their phones and they film the storyboard. So now they can start simulating the film itself. They can put on the music and so on just using their own voices, their own music and so on, very cheap to do. And that's the whole point that this, all this learning is done on the cheap. So no expensive actors have been hired yet to do the voiceovers. You know, they, they, they hire the mm-hmm. best actors, the most famous actors in the world are used for the voiceover. They're expensive. They get the best music composers in the world to compose the music, also very expensive. But none of this is done yet, not until they really know what they're doing. So this is cheap. And this process is, it goes through eight or nine iterations, pro, uh, typically at Pixar. And it takes two years, around two years, plus minus a few months, typically at Pixar. And it's really given priority because they know if we've done this process well, then when we start shooting, we can do it fairly quickly and fairly cheaply. And therefore also reducing the risks because anything that is done fast is exposed to less risk than anything that takes a long time. So time is a killer in terms of risk and the shorter you can do things the less risk you are exposed to because mm-hmm. time create time creates variation we know that and uh, and and pixar really understands how to uh, minimize that risk by doing things fairly quickly once they get to the shooting so that's what pixar does they use iterations and experiments and simulations to get to a point where once they start shooting the films, they've actually already done it several times before, you know, eight, nine times before in different versions. And that's why they are so good at it. And that's why, unlike any other studio in more than a 100 years Hollywood history, they have done blockbuster after blockbuster after blockbuster, 22, 23 blockbusters by now. Wow. No other studio has ever succeeded in doing this, which, of course, is why Pixar is extremely interesting to us because the mm-hmm. fact that they are able to do this show that they, they are not just lucky. You wouldn't be able to do so many successes by luck alone. That is so unlikely that we can regard it as zero. And therefore, we wanted to see what's the secret. What's the methodology that they have? What is the process that they're using? What is their secret sauce? And what I just told you is the secret sauce. That's why Pixar is so successful. And anybody can learn from that. So no matter what type of project that you're doing, what you want to do is to have iterations and simulations up front where you are simulating your, your project instead of actually doing it and learning from the simulations. Once you've done enough simulations that you know everything about this project that can go wrong and so on, then you can start doing the project and you will find that you will be able to do it in a cheaper way and in a faster way. That's uh, great learning from a different industry. As, as you said, we can apply, we see in engineering that so many times we get into the end of a phase of a development phase to get a good and comprehensive review of the project. And then, as you said, it's maybe too late to develop too much before getting enough feedback to improve your design, to improve your solution. And you spend hours and hours of engineering and estimating and so on. I, I can see that we are using much more technology to help us in defining those projects and designing those projects, but not as much in simulations, as you said, then you can test different things in a plan and simulate and see for construction, for operations, for safety, and then you get the design right and you advance. What we see is a series of major returns on projects or major uh, reworks on projects too late in the stream almost get into execution, sometimes in execution, we, we see in the fat tails. That's the opposite of what I'm talking about here. And that's the opposite of the way that the successful project leaders do it, like Frank Gehry and Pixar and others. And it's it's re- actually important to emphasize that this is nothing new. The Empire State Building was built like this. They didn't have the computers, but they simulated the whole thing, you know, physically. And they they figured out everything in detail and they got as much as possible manufactured off site so that that 
that the, the Empire State Building was as much of a, an assembly site as possible, you know, and they used modularity big time. They actually said, no, we didn't build a skyscraper. We built the same floor 122 <laughs> times. And That's so, great. and, 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 uh, you know, they took the first floor took quite a while, you know, and uh, then the second floor, they had learned some, they were a little faster and the third floor a little faster than that. And they got up to an incredible speed. You know, they built this in just over one year. You know, they built the whole wow. skyscraper on time, on time, on the budget, on the budget, significantly on the budget. As far as I remember, 17 percent on the budget, which which wow. is, 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 is many millions of dollars in today's money. Mm -hmm. And it was really fast. And you see. So many years ago, and we can't replicate the success uh, today. Thinking about modularity and 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 so on. You mentioned uh, China. Uh, I would like to know if, from your research, what you are seeing in terms of trend. Are we getting better in developing those projects? Is there any uh, country that is doing better, or industry? You mentioned around uh, about the wind and solar power industries. Is that any one of them? other one that you see that is improving over time so wind and solar have been pretty good from the beginning i mean they had they had to invent the technology first but once they understood what the technology was and so on and and they understood how to uh, manufacture wind turbines instead of constructing them so the first wind turbine that delivered more than one megawatts was a construction project it was built on site you know in denmark it's a, a danish uh, wind turbine is still operating uh, mm -hmm. a good build but it became clear to the people who would, were enthusiasts uh, at that time for wind. This is way back in the 70s. And they could see that it's not a good idea to do it as construction. So they were building a wind turbine as a building, as they would build a tall building and then put the wings on, right? Uh, and, and fairly quickly, they realized this has to be manufactured uh, instead. And they turned it into a manufacturing process instead of a construction process. And that's the secret to the success of the wind industry. And they got that fairly early. And now, you know, they're, they're way ahead. Uh, but so that's that's one successful area. They do have problems right now. There are things that are coming back to bite them the, in the wind industry. Like, uh, you know, if you if you build the if you build weak wings, it's going to show up, you mm -hmm. know, and, and there have been some examples like Siemens Gamesa right now, which is one of the biggest uh, wind turbine producers in the world. It turns out that they have had some products with the uh, uh, quality problems. And then, of course, when you put things out in that kind of weather that has to take that kind of strain, those problems are going to surface. And that has happened. Another thing is undersea cables, you know, that the cables get eroded, you know, when they move with the water across the rocks and so on. And there's a bunch of things that are coming up now. And of course, just a general inflation, that inflation is higher, supply chains have been difficult and so on. So it's not like, the wind industry or the solar industry are totally insulated from problems. Nothing is, but they have much fewer problems than the other industries. And they have been able to reduce a whole set of problems away, basically, uh, because of their modularity and their speeds. Uh, and I would say the same pipelines is another area. We see in our data that pipelines are actually performing very well. Uh, which could be lucky, you know, if we're going to have a lot of hydrogen projects that could become in handy. Uh, but even more importantly, transmission lines, we also see in our data that transmission lines, and right now people are beginning to realize that, hey, we actually need to have a much more integrated uh, energy transmission or rather yeah. electricity <laughs> transmission system with with like high speeds, uh direct voltage cables uh, running uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles, if not thousands, uh, across continents and uh, across uh, ocean floors in order to integrate the different uh, parts of the electricity system. Uh, it's mm -hmm. really important. Otherwise, we can't make things work if we're not able to spread the electricity production out over much larger geographical areas than we have been used to so far. Electricity production have actually been a very localized process. If you look at it geographically, that is not sustainable in the future because there's so much variation in the renewables that they need to be even out, evened out over a much more, uh, over a much larger geographical area. That's happening now. That's beginning to happen. And luckily, it turns out that uh, electricity transmission is also modular and something you can do at speed. 
So those are some of the areas. And like I said, China has specialized in those types of projects. And, and I think the West, you know, so North America and Europe and uh, other parts of the world, you know, Australia, Brazil, the areas not in Asia should really pay attention to this because we might we might be outcompeted if we don't wake up and and uh, focus on this the same way that China does. All of a sudden, China is going to be able to completely disrupt certain industries, and and we are not going to be able to be in on it because unless we put up trade barriers and then create our own protected industries, but. History shows that's not a good idea. Look what happened to the Soviet Union. They put up this and they got a, they got a, a type of car that nobody wanted to drive anywhere else in the world, right? So as soon as they put down the trade barriers, those cars just died, you know, that, that whole auto industry just died. You don't want to create a, a global situation like that. So it's better. It's better to keep up with the competition. And I think that that's one thing we need to do now is to look carefully at what happens in China and try to keep up with the competition. Great. And the characteristics of the projects you mentioned, like uh, energy transmission, wind power, solar power, they all have those uh, characteristics, as you said, they can be modular. They are modular per se. So we can learn from this experience once again to bring to, to our projects. That's fantastic. Uh, Professor Fluvia, I, I could go on for hours here. It's a great class for our community here in Brazil, but we are ending our, our conversation here. And I always ask our guests to provide a few recommendations for future project managers of complex projects on how they can prepare themselves for the challenges. And so what piece of advice would you like to give to them? So the, the, the one thing that I really want every project manager and every project leader, and indeed any leader who's related to projects, and that means any leader, because no leaders today don't deal with projects, is your biggest risk is you. You are your own biggest risk. The problem with project management is that risk is misperceived, that people don't understand what the risks are and therefore they go wrong. So it's not that all these objective risks are not out there. And people like to think about risk as something that's coming from the outside and hitting you, like the bad weather in construction or the archaeology that we talked about earlier or the world prices of steel or concrete, you know, or other materials that you need, or the price of labor. These are all things coming from the outside, and we like to think about risk like that. I'm saying that's wrong. Not because those risks don't exist, they do exist. But the real problem is that we actually misperceive those risks. We, don't, we are optimistic about most of those risks. Just to take one example, we anchor in the wrong base rates. If you think about going to the casino and playing, every good player wants to know what the odds are. You don't have a chance of winning if you don't know what the odds are. But most project leaders have no clue what the odds are in their own business. That's a very sad fact. And that's why you are your own biggest risk. So that's one thing. That's a major lesson. And if I could say only that you only remember one thing from today's this conversation, that's what I want you to remember. But there are lots of other things like get the team right. So it's all dependent on the team. And no matter how good a business plan you have, If you have a lousy team, they're not going to be able to deliver your business plan. So it's self-evident that you need to think a lot about who you hire. And you basically only want to hire people or the majority of people that you hire or the people in the most senior positions have to be people who have a track record with actually delivering the type of project that you're now delivering. You cannot hope for success if people have not tried to already deliver what you now want them to deliver for you. Again, that sounds like a no-brainer. You have no idea what I have seen of people who are total amateurs and they are allowed to do multi-billion dollar projects of a type they've never done before. And they get to play with your money and do all their mistakes with your money. You don't want to do that. You, you want to make sure that you get a team that uh, has the experience that you need So th those those are two main things. But look in the book, you know, at the end of the book, I actually summarize in 11 heuristics, I call it. So those are, are, are 11 rules of thumb that if you follow these 11 rules of thumb, you have a pr pretty good chance of being successful with your projects. It's, it's uh, So we summarize the whole book in just a few pages like that. Uh, rules of thumb uh, that will lead you to success with your own projects, whether big or small. Great. Professor Fluvier, great lessons. Good to hear from you. 
uh, from the scope of your research. And we know that this new book will be available in Brazil very soon. Thank you once again. It was an honor to talk to you here in the Capital Projects podcast and the project management community in Brazil. Thank you for having me. And again, the book is already available in Brazil, actually, but in English. So it'll be available in, in uh, Portuguese uh, later. But thank right. you for thank having you. me. A real pleasure. Great questions. Thank you for the questions. As we can learn with Professor Fluvier, dealing with mega projects is a huge challenge, but we have ways to improve our performance. Just take care of the influence of bias, look for ways to make the project more modular and improve our teams in order to identify and treat risks as soon as possible. We can see that the fundamentals are still important for this kind of project. It will not be able to succeed unless we have uh, reached a better maturity, a better planning to our projects before approving for execution. So I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And I truly recommend reading Professor Slubier's new book. I'll post here in the description of the episode the link so you can look for it in Amazon. Thanks for being with us and I look forward to seeing you in the future in the next episode here in the Capital Projects podcast. Stay tuned, follow our channel, and I hope you have huge success in your future projects. <music>